Hello everyone, in this video we are going to revisit a classic physics problem. Now the problem is essentially you have a particle, as we've got in this diagram, uh, sitting at the top of a sphere, and the particle is going to slide down the surface of the sphere starting from rest, and we're supposed to find the angle theta at which the particle loses contact with the surface of the sphere. Now I made a video on this same problem a while ago, uh, I used the approach of considering the forces acting on the particle, which is definitely the easiest and most direct way to do it. However, uh, someone recently commented asking if I could go through the uh, the same problem but using Lagrangian mechanics instead. I thought that would be an interesting thing to do. So in this video, we're going to do the same problem, but uh, we are going to take the Lagrangian approach this time. So I've just put at the top here a differential equation, which you may recognize the first two terms of. So this dl by dqi minus d by dt of dl by dq dot i, that looks very much like the standard Euler-Lagrange equation that you get in Lagrangian mechanics. L is the Lagrangian, qi are your generalized coordinates. I've also got this third term here, plus lambda df by dqi. Now, you may or may not have seen that before. If you haven't seen that, I suggest that you either um, watch my previous video, which was all about constrained Lagrangian mechanics. I show the meaning of that term and where it comes from, or just go and read up about constrained Lagrangian mechanics. But essentially, it's a term that has to appear in our equations of motion to ensure that for the first part of the motion, um, the particle doesn't fall through the surface of the sphere, basically. It's, it ensures that the particle is constrained to move along the surface of the sphere. So let's just be clear about what the various terms in this, uh, this equation actually are in this particular case. Um, I'm going to start by defining my vector of generalized coordinates, q, um, to be r and theta, where r and theta are the standard polar coordinates. I'm putting the origin of my coordinate system at the center of the sphere. Um, r is just the distance from the center of the sphere, and theta is the angle as defined in the diagram. So what about this f that appears in that extra term in our equations of motion? Well, f is a function which is supposed to be zero. It's a function of the uh, the generalized coordinates, so I'm going to write it as f of r and theta. Um, it's a function that is supposed to always be equal to zero, and that defines the way that your particle is constrained to move. Now in this case, um, until the particle leaves the surface of the sphere, it's subject to a constraint where the coordinate r minus some constant capital R, right, capital R is the radius of the sphere that it's sliding down, is supposed to be equal to zero, right? So if r minus r is equal to zero, um, that enforces the constraint that your coordinate lowercase r is always equal to your um, constant radius of the sphere, capital R. So that's what the f in that lambda df by dqi term is. Note that it doesn't actually depend on theta at all, um, but I'm still writing it as f of r and theta because in general your constraint function can depend on all of the generalized coordinates. It just means in this case the partial derivative with respect to theta is just zero. Well that's all of the basic setup. Let's construct our Lagrangian. Um, so Lagrangian is always t minus v, where t is kinetic energy and v is potential energy. Uh, kinetic energy here is just the standard expression for kinetic energy in polar coordinates. So we've got our half m r dot squared for the kinetic energy due to any radial motion. Um, and we've got our kinetic energy in the tangential direction. So half m r squared theta dot squared, right? Because r theta dot is just the tangential velocity. What about potential energy? Well, the only potential energy in this problem is gravitational potential energy, which is just mgh, where h is the height of the particle above some specified reference point. And I think what makes the most sense in this case is to take your, uh, your reference point of zero potential energy to be the center of the sphere. Now, how do we come up with an expression for the height of the particle above our reference point? Well, from the diagram, the height that we want is basically, let me draw a little vertical line um, like this, it's basically the length of that red vertical line, I guess really we're going up to the center of mass of the particle. Um, now, because the particle at any given instant is at a distance of lowercase r from the origin, then from trigonometry, because this angle here is also theta, um, the length of the red line is just lowercase r times cos theta. And so in my Lagrangian, I just get a minus mg times that height, so minus mg r cos theta. Now notice that in my Lagrangian, I haven't got any capital R's anywhere. I've stuck with our general coordinate, lowercase r. Um, this is basically how it has to be when you use this method of Lagrange multipliers to do Lagrangian mechanics with, with constraints, right? You write down your unconstrained Lagrangian, so r could be anything, and then later on, 
um, we're going to apply the constraint that lowercase r is actually constrained to be capital R. So now we can extract our equations of motion from that Lagrangian using our sort of generalized Euler Lagrange equation up at the top there. Let's first get the equation of motion for r. In other words, we're going to do all our partial derivatives with respect to r and r dot first. So for your dl by dr term, there is no r dependence in the first bit. Um, there is an r dependence from the second term. If we differentiate that, we get mr theta dot squared. From this third term here, we just get minus mg cos theta. We need to uh, differentiate with respect to r. Um, what about this minus d by dt of dl by dr dot? Well, the only r dot dependence in the Lagrangian is in the first term. If you differentiate the first term with respect to r dot, you just get um, m times r dot. But then you have to take the time derivative of that. Because the mass is a constant, that is going to give you m times r double dot. So we subtract off that. So minus m r double dot. What about this lambda df by dqi? that constraint force term. Well, df by dr, uh, remember f is just small r minus big r, big r is a constant, and so when you differentiate that with respect to r, you just get one. And so from the third term, I just get plus lambda times one, so just plus lambda, um, and that is all supposed to equal zero. So now let's get our theta equation of motion. So, okay, first we've got to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to theta. The only theta dependence is in that last bit. And taking into account the minus sign, when you differentiate it, you just get positive or plus mgr times sine theta. Then what about our middle bit? Minus d by dt of dl by d theta dot. I'm going to just write that in as minus d by dt. dl by d theta dot has to come from the middle term of the Lagrangian. Uh, you differentiate that with respect to theta dot, and you're going to get mr squared. Um, times theta dot, and then that whole thing is supposed to be equal to zero. There's no lambda in this equation of motion because our constraint function f doesn't depend on theta, so df by d theta is just zero. Now if we want to, we can use the product rule to expand that derivative. Uh, if we do that, we'll get, so we've still got our mgr sine theta at the beginning. Uh, let's differentiate the theta dot first, and that just gives you minus m, uh, sorry, mr squared theta double dot. Then you differentiate the r squared, and you're going to get a minus 2mr times r dot from the chain rule, and then times theta dot is equal to zero. Now at this point, we have our set of equations of motion. We've got our two equations of motion. Um, now we can actually apply the constraint. So let's apply the constraint, which is lowercase r equals capital R. Um, and as a result of that, because we're constraining lowercase r to just be a constant, that means r dot and r double dot are both zero. Right? If you differentiate a constant, you just get zero. Now, what does that imply from our equations of motion? So let's first look back at our r equation of motion um, and just substitute in our constraints. So that first term is going to become m times capital R theta dot squared. Uh, the uh, second term is going to be, uh, well, that doesn't change, still minus mg cos theta. This minus mr double dot term now disappears, and you just get um, plus lambda uh, is equal to zero. What about from our theta equation of motion? Well, again, that first term there doesn't really change. We get mg capital R instead of lowercase r. That's the only change there, uh, times sine theta. You still need your minus m capital R squared theta double dot term, because theta double dot doesn't have to be zero. But then this third term that we got from the product rule now disappears because r dot itself is zero. So that's supposed to be zero. Now we have our two um, sort of constrained equations of motion. Let's label those one and two for future reference. I guess before we proceed, we can do one thing to make equation two look a bit nicer, which is divide, divide through by both m and r to get g sine theta um, minus just r times theta double dot is equal to zero. We can't really do that with equation one um, because this lambda term doesn't have an m in it. So what we've got here is a differential equation for theta. So we really want to integrate it to solve it. But the problem is that theta um, depends on time. And so you can't just directly integrate the whole left hand side with respect to time. Now to deal with that, we are going to use the chain rule. So let's consider what theta double dot really means. Well, theta double dot is the second derivative of theta, dt theta by dt squared, or in terms of theta dot, 
it's just the first derivative of theta dot, so d theta dot by dt. So you can change this time derivative into a theta derivative using the chain rule. Um, I'm going to write that then as d theta dot by d theta, a bit of a strange looking term, um, but that's okay. Then we have to times that by d theta by dt. You can imagine those d thetas basically cancelling each other out. But then this d theta by dt is just theta dot by definition. So that becomes theta dot um, times d theta dot by d theta. Now it will become clear why this is useful when you substitute it into that equation too. Um, so from our equation two, the first term was just g sine theta. Let's leave that as it is um, for the moment. The second term, um, we just substitute our theta double dot here for this expression that we got from the chain rule. And um, let's also move it to the other side and make it positive. So we get g sine theta equals r theta dot d theta dot by d theta. Now you can view this as just a separable first order differential equation where your variables are theta dot and theta. So what I can do, let's make a bit of space, move that term over. Um, we can take the d theta over to the left hand side and then just integrate both sides like so. So integrating sine gives you minus cos. So you've got minus g cos theta on the left. Um, we'll put our constant of integration on the right, but we integrate with respect to theta dot and you get half r theta dot squared plus some constant. Now, how do we get that constant? Well, we said that our particle was released from rest at the top of the sphere. So when theta is zero, right, uh, that gives you cos theta is one. So your left-hand side is going to be minus g when we evaluate it at theta equals zero, which is the top of the sphere. But at that point, um, your theta dot is zero because it's released from rest. So you get g minus g is zero plus c. Um, and therefore c is just minus g. And then we put that all together. Um, I'm also going to multiply everything by two to get rid of that factor of a half. And you conclude that r theta dot squared is equal to 2g um, times 1 minus cos theta, right? This one here has basically come from our, our c. I've just rearranged and, and factorized a little bit there. So here is our integrated version of equation 2. Um, now, we've got this r theta dot squared term, which also appears in equation 1. So we can actually solve this by substituting our integrated equation 2 into equation 1. Um, and so we get our first term becomes mg, it's really 2mg, um, times 1 minus cos theta. Then we get minus mg cos theta, that was already there, plus lambda is equal to 0. If you just expand the brackets and collect the like terms together, then you'll get 2mg minus 3mg cos theta, plus lambda is equal to 0. Now we have to think a little bit about the physical interpretation. Again, as I was talking about in my last video on constrained Lagrangian mechanics in general, the interpretation of this lambda df by dqi term is that it is, is the generalized force, which in this problem really just means it's a force. It's the force which enforces the constraint. Um, what that means in this particular context is that it's the normal contact force between the particle and the surface of the sphere, because it's precisely that normal contact force which prevents the particle from falling through the surface of the sphere and keeps it moving along the trajectory defined by small r minus big R is equal to zero. Now, the point at which the particle suddenly leaves the surface of the sphere will be exactly the point where there is no contact force anymore. So what we can do is take this lambda term, which is the normal contact force, and just set it equal to zero. When we do that, we can nicely cancel out the mg's because you don't have that lambda there anymore, right? So you get two minus three cos theta equals zero. I should specify this is now in the special case where lambda goes to zero. Um, and you just rearrange that and you get, well, theta is the inverse cos of two thirds. Now this is of course exactly the same result that we got when we just considered the forces directly and set our normal contact force um, to zero. Uh, last time we went through this problem using the force approach, um, but it's kind of interesting to see that as long as you know how to deal with constraints in Lagrangian mechanics, you can do it this way as well. Uh, you need to understand the physical interpretation of the lambda, but then it just comes down to, to setting that equal to zero. So that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed uh, the problem and the solution, and uh, thank you for watching.